this opportunity. So um, a bit of my background, I've been studying elephants now for more than 25 years and um, I head up uh, NGO, a South African based NGO called Elephants Alive. Um, and obviously through these years, we've learned so much that it's quite difficult to condense it in um, the space of a, a, a short presentation, but I'm gonna try my best. So my topic is why elephants and what can we learn from them? Um, so to tell you about our mission statement, and this is where all our activities are, they rooted in this mission statement. Um, our mission is to ensure the survival of elephants and their habitats and to promote harmonious coexistence between elephants and people. And we've got various field activities that have um, taught us so much through the years, and I'm going to take you through some of them. So um, firstly, we've got an amazing tracking database because of so many years of collaring elephants. And then we've also got an ID study where we've got over 2000 elephants identified. And then we've got a very important tree protection study because that's quite a burning um, issue in South Africa specifically. But you might ask, so where, where is our study area? And it's not just South Africa. We actually work wherever elephants take us. Um, so we've done most of our work within an area called Great Limpopo Trans Frontier Conservation Area, which straddles three countries, Limpopo, a national park in Mozambique, Greater Kruger National, Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa, and then Gora Renzu National Park in Zimbabwe. But you can see all those little elephant icons on the map is actually where we've collared elephants. So we've also collared elephants in Benin National Park in Mozambique, Maputo Special Reserve and the Futi Corridor. And then very importantly, outside of protected areas. So the one thing that we've been trying to answer um, is to look at what are the different drivers of elephant movements. And there are four important drive, drivers that we can um, share with you. So the one is risk avoidance. You know, we all know elephants are very intelligent, um, so they will avoid moving to dangerous areas. Then um, social benefits play a very big role in motivating elephant movements, but you can only look into that if you're running an individual ID study, which... Um, all the Kenyan-based viewers will fully understand and appreciate the wonderful work of Cynthia Moss and Joyce Poole with years and years of dedication. Also, Save the Elephants in Samburu, and our ID study started in 1996 here in South Africa as well. So only if you can recognize individual elephants can you start seeing, oh, these elephants are moving into an area to meet up with those other elephants. Otherwise, it's almost impossible. So most academic studies often steer away from ID studies because it's it, you only start seeing the benefits after many years of getting to know your population. And then of course, habitat quality. So elephants have large appetites and they drink a lot of water. So the habitat needs to be suitable um, to keep them going. But we've seen specifically in South Africa where we've got a history of putting up fences and taking down fences that past management practices also influence elephant movements. So to tell you a bit about our tracking study and to highlight some of the findings, um, we're going to look at the basic home range sizes, we're going to look at the concept of sexual segregation in elephants, we're going to look at fear landscapes, and then I'll introduce you to um, some elephant characters that we've got to know. So our tracking record started in 1998, so that's been going for a very long time, and I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience what's involved when you collar an elephant. It's quite an expensive exercise, but it's critical to understand how elephants move, and these collars give us eyes in the skies to, uh, to understand what is driving elephant movements. And what we found so far is that on average, cows have half the home range size of bulls. And you can see there the range for cows differs really greatly. So some herds have very small home range sizes, while others have quite big home range sizes. 
Then when you come to the bulls, there's a big distinction between the different age groups of bulls. And what we found is that these young bulls are the great explorers. So these bulls that first start breaking away from the family when they're about 12 to 15 years old, they've got a home range size of six and a half um, thousand square kilometers and up to about 12,000 square kilometers. Where the prime bulls also have fairly big home range sizes, but it's very much depends on where they decide to have their must versus their non-must range. And yeah, you can see a map of all our um, collared bulls behavior uh, movements throughout the year. And that little red dot is basically where we are based, where our head, where Elephants Alive's headquarters of, um, is based. And what you can see here is that there are amazing movements that elephants are making from the south of Kruger National Park into, um, for instance, the Futi Corridor and then into Tembi National Park into South Africa. And recently we've had an elephant um, that we've called Swazi because when we first collared him, he moved into Eswatini. And he's basically moved, um, linked Maputo, Maputo Special Reserve, the Futi Corridor Tembi with Eswatini, which is also an incredible movement. If you compare that now to the cows home range, so these are the various areas that we've collared cows in, and you can see that they are far more site faithful than the bulls. And one of the things that probably heavily um, defines cow movements is safety. So they are very cautious before they move into dangerous areas, which obviously would explain this more condensed movement that they have compared to the bulls that move across very risky landscapes, specifically outside of protected areas. To tell you a little bit about sexual segregation, um, it's quite an amazing phenomenon that's, that you find amongst elephants and it's not based on any aggression. So it's um, primarily based on physiological differences between bulls and cows. So there's a nice example in that photo of a young cow and a mature prime bull in his forties. Um, and you can see the size difference. So because the bulls are so big, they have to maintain a very bulky diet. There's got to be a lot of it, but it can be low quality. Then you compare that to cows. So they've got a much smaller body size, a much higher mass specific metabolic rate. And they need a lot of nutrients because often they're also pregnant and lactating. So what that means is they've got to occupy nutrient rich areas. So what we found in these private reserves where we've been studying elephants for many years, we found that the poor range of bulls, which is that red, that blue lobe that you see, um, is almost 100% overlapping with a specific vegetation type called Mupani. So Mupani is very, um, it's a very dominant vegetation type. It's got low nutrient value but there's a lot of it. So it's the perfect area for the bulls to hang around in and to get all they need. Where the cows we found, their core ranges are really overlapping with very nutrient rich areas, which are often um, flagged by what we call microphyllous vegetation. So these small leaved acacias. And when the bulls want to move out of these bull areas when they must, then they'll occupy the cow areas. But there is this amazing phenomenon of sexual segregation, which at the end of the day, it allows the landscape to carry more elephants because they're partitioning their resources. And then, as I said earlier, um, elephants are risk avoiders. So they don't, need, they don't want conflict with people unless they have to, maybe they're craving something, or they have to move to another protected area to meet up with um, a breeding opportunity. But how do elephants respond to fear? And there's two very um, easy ways in which you can identify how elephants are responding to fear. The one is they shift their home range to safer areas. And the other is that they change their movements from um, being di diurnal to mostly nocturnal. And that's because they know that we are awake during the day. And if they want to avoid conflict with us, they need to sneak around us at night. 
So we've got many elephants that actually show this pattern, but I'm just flagging one individual here. It was an individual that we collared up in the north of Kruger. And you can see that this elephant's home range spread over Kruger National Park in South Africa and Limpopo National Park in uh, Mozambique prior to that peak in the ivory poaching. And then you can see the core range of this animal are the little dark blue dots. After the poaching um, escalated, this elephant contracted its home range back into Kruger National Park, which was offering more safety to the animal. And its core range um, stayed more or less in the same area, but was more condensed to where we first collared it. And then, as I said, elephants, fear makes elephants nocturnal. So here's another great example of how elephants respond to what we're doing. So this is one elephant's movement. And you can see when the elephant is in Kruger National Park, its ratio of day to night movements is more or less equal. And also it has, its movements have far more what we call tortuosity, which means that it curves back on itself. Um, and it's not very directional because it's just ambling about while it's feeding. But as soon as that same elephant moves into Mozambique, it realizes that it has to move far differently to survive. And what we find is they move very directionally, long distances at night. And then in the day, they hide out in um, very thick bush um, in very, and they have very small movements during the day so that they can conceal themselves and prevent people from potentially um, poaching them. So to introduce you to one of the elephant characters that we got to know here in South Africa, and this also um, brings us back to one of the drivers of elephant movements is often micro minerals. Um, so we had this, we had three elephants that broke out of the protected areas and they went to the mango farmers um, about 46 kilometers down river from the protected areas. And we named these three elephants Wayne Derek Lotta in honor of Wayne who was assassinated for his work that he did in trying to stop ivory poaching. Um, but anyway, the youngest elephant of this group, Lotta, was an incredible little animal that could climb over anything and over any barrier. So with great effort, we went to dart these elephants with a wonderful wildlife veterinary team um, in the Blader River Mountains, and we trucked them back to the safety of the reserve. Only for this particular young elephant to cross nearly any barrier that we put up for him. So we um, built a huge barrier across the weir because we saw he was climbing over a weir by the river. And even that couldn't stop him, but luckily it stopped his um, companions. And because he was a very young animal between 15 and 20, he was too scared to wander all the way down the river without his companions. But he was in clever enough to know that when it's daytime, he better be back in the reserve and not be wandering around. So what he would do is he would cross a very busy tar road and go to the boom gate of the protected area and literally stand there and wait for the guide guard to open the boom gate so that he could walk back into the reserve. And we were just astounded that this little young bull had that level of intelligence to ask the guide guard to open for him so that he could be back in safety by daybreak. But we were also very lucky to see that after a while, Lotta stopped with his tricks because he discovered Palaborua Mining Company. So this is a huge phosphorus mine um, that's close to our protected area that we based in. And um, at this mine, they, they mine phosphorus and they bring it to the surface where the work that I did for my studies proved that both bull groups and cow groups are um, pretty nutrient deficient when it comes to phosphorus in the larger landscape. So as soon as Lotta discovered the mine, um, he, he stopped his urge of wanting to go and, and move outside of the protected areas. And it's very interesting to know that a lot of um, the science work that's now coming out is that crops are very rich in phosphorus. And that's usually when they become so attractive to elephants that it almost forces them to come into conflict with people. 
So just to briefly tell you about the ID study. So as I said, this started in 1996 and it involves painstakingly record, recording the nicks and tears on the outer ear line of elephants so that you can recognize individuals. And this is really important so that you can estimate population size, but also it shows us how we find, and our, our study is very focused on bulls, um, how you can find these mentors within bull society, um, because they play a very important role to the younger bulls that um, associate with them over time. And through social network analysis, we've been able to see which individuals are literally the keystone individuals within the male society. They have so many young bulls um, that need to be around them. And of course, um, if you listen to Dr. Lucy Bates' presentation, she told you all about the social discrimination that elephants have so they can recognize particular individuals and also respond to particular individuals um, as they wish, which is amazing that they've got that brain capacity. Then to tell you about um, another really important part of the activities that we do here in South Africa is we monitor big trees. Um, because as I said, in South Africa, there is this concern, we've got an expanding elephant population, and there's this concern, what impact are the elephants having on the large trees? So to, to walk you through that, um, I thought it's important to flag what is the individual importance of these hardwood, long-lived trees and elephants. Um, and then I'll explain how it's important to consider the interaction between large trees and elephants, and not necessarily just the one or the other. So if we look at these hardwoods, they're very important in terms of buffering climatic imbalances. Um, they're critical as nutrient pumps. So often they bring micro minerals from deep beneath this, the surface of the earth to the surface. And then you get specific grass species growing under these large trees that you wouldn't get elsewhere. And then of course, we know that they're very critical to prevent erosion and flooding. When you look at elephants, ecologically, they're keystone species. So often they um, fulfill ecological roles that no other species can fulfill. So for instance, um, they can dig wells in dry river beds and that's critical to other species that need to access that water if it's not available. They're also known as umbrella species. So when you're protecting elephants because of their large spatial requirements, you automatically end up protecting a whole lot of other species. They're also pathfinders and makers. Um, and I'm sure our tracking data actually very clearly illustrated to you that they, with ease, specifically the bulls can move over three countries, three or more countries. And then a little later, I'll tell you why I think elephants are social role models. If we look at the similarities between hardwoods and elephants, they're both large in size, they're long lived, they have slow recruitment into older age classes, and they are of economic value to man. So for hardwoods, they're often used for fuel and furniture, and elephants are used often for tusks, tourism, and trophies. But what this means is that they are both very susceptible to over-exploitation. So if we look at elephants on a continental scale, it's quite terrifying to see that in the past 100 years, there's been a 97% decline in the African elephant, which is quite staggering. And this is primarily been due to the value of their tusks for, the, for illegal ivory trade. If we look at how they were distributed, so more than 30 years ago, we had most of the elephants in Central and East Africa where today, because of the heavy poaching to the north of the southern states, um, we've now got the, the, the most elephants, the highest density in the southern states of Africa. If we look at what's happened to the hardwoods, we know that wood fuel, which includes charcoal and firewood demands, have led to a 68% of deforestation in Africa. And we also know that with 1% of urbanization, there's a 14% increase in charcoal demands. 
it's predicted that by 2025, more than 50% of Africans will be urbanized. So um, one can safely say that charcoal demands have caused an extensive loss of natural forests and woodlands, and specifically selection for these living old growth um, hardwood species. So if we have to now bear in mind that both hardwoods and elephants have been heavily persecuted and extrapolated over time, why is it important to have both? And what is the interactive importance between them? So for the hardwoods, they are valuable to elephants as shelter and as shade. So if you, a big bull that's got a, a shoulder height of more than three meters, you do need a large tree to rest under so that you can thermoregulate on some of these very hot African days. And then as our tracking data showed us, you need a certain density of trees in which you can hide out. So um, in those areas in Mozambique where the elephants are hiding out during the day, they're mostly hiding out in small clumps of ironwood forest, which helps them become almost invisible. So hardwoods are also important in terms of security for elephants. And then obviously it's a source of food. So in the dry season, when elephants are mainly browsers, they're dependent on tree species and woody species. And so directly they can get their forage from them, but also indirectly because of these different grass species that grow under the shade or the canopy of the large trees. And then if we look at what is elephants value to large trees, they are incredible fertilizing agents. So a large bull can produce up to 150 kilograms of dung per day. And the beauty of this is that they're often carrying it against the gradient. So um, most of these soils around us are very ancient soils that have been leached through many years of rainfall of all their minerals. And then you have elephants that are carrying um, fertilizer basically against the gradient and depositing it on the uplands. And that's a very important nutrient cycle that people often forget about. Then they also incredible seed dispersal agents. They can carry seeds up to 65 kilometers from their source. So that's actually the largest dispersal, terrestrial dispersal agent in the world. Um, we all know they are vegetation modifying agents. So they change the structural vegetation um, by lowering the canopy and making it available to other animals. And there's also been some scientific papers that have proved that in, ca in certain cases, they can also increase the chemical composition of the plants that they feed on because they cause um, a flush of new growth after they've fed on a particular plant. So overall, um, we've always believed in trying to promote this interactive, import, um, in, interactive importance between large trees and large elephants. Um, and we feel that you can do that by directly protecting the resources. So in this case, it would be large trees. And we've done that through various methods over time. So we've tried wire wrapping, where particular species are susceptible to bark stripping. And that certainly has increased the survival rate of those species that are susceptible to bark stripping. But the method that has worked the best over time has actually been using the African honeybee to protect iconic trees. And that's been part of a, a master study by Robin Cook that's been working um, with Elephants Alive since 2014. So, um, We've got wonderful records to prove that by protecting iconic trees on the landscape, you're not only um, ensuring a certain picture that people and managers find, tourists and managers find acceptable. So they like seeing iconic big trees in the landscape, but you're also ensuring that you have those individuals to propagate seeds um, and repopulate the rest of the landscape over time. And what we've got from this tree protection study over time is we've had wonderful um, wild honey produced that, that we can sell. We've also had lip balm, we've made honey infused soaps, we've made bee wax wraps, and we've also partnered with another NGO in South Africa called Relate, where we sell these bee bracelets, and all that money goes back into the, into the project. 
And what we've seen over time is that bee, a, a, a tree that has a beehive in it probably has a five time higher chance of survival than a tree that doesn't. So it's a very effective method of um, protecting individual iconic trees across the landscape. So now to come to um, more of a philosophical part of the presentation after just sharing some of our fieldwork experience with you. I think it's important for us to ask how are we coexisting with elephants? And if we look back in time in the last hundred years, our numbers have increased from 1.6 billion to 7.7 .7 billion, which represents a 387% increase. And at the same time, over that same period, elephants have declined from more than 10 million to less than 400,000 elephants, which represents a 97% decline. And this is probably one of the reasons why on a continental scale, the IUCN has now listed the African elephant from vulnerable to endangered and the forest elephant from endangered to critically endangered. And we know through wonderful scientific work that 76% of elephants are spread across more than one political boundary, which means that countries politically have to work together to protect elephants. We also know that more than half of elephants current range is outside of protected areas. So in a nutshell, we're seeing this consistent decline of elephants on a continental scale, um, with the exception of the Southern states due to over exploitation. And that's probably also because they compete directly with us for resources. Then we've also seen a a decline outside of protected areas, which is largely driven by a loss of suitable habitat and increasing human elephant conflict. So this means that increasing human elephant conflict um, is gonna result in elephants continually pushing our boundaries. And this conflict takes different forms. So on the bottom end of the scale, we find that um, you get peaceful interactions between tourists and elephants when they know to, how to behave around each other. Then you get mild forms of conflict, which we experience in South Africa, where people are very concerned about the impact that elephants have on large trees. Um, and, you know, that, that causes a, a form of irritation and concern with managers and with tourists and can even lead to the culling of elephants like we've experienced in the past. And then you also get where elephants intimidate people and where people intimidate elephants. And right on the upper end of the scale, you either find the loss of human life or the loss of elephant life due to this conflict. But I think the way forward, it's important for us not to only consider the ecological aspects of elephants, but also the social, economic, and the moral aspects of elephant conservation in our decision making. I mean, if our population is increasing, we have to consider people as part of this conservation plan. If we don't, I don't think we're going to get very far. We also have to realize that the strength that lies in matriarchal societies for collective problem solving. And the elephants are a prime example of that. The matriarch leads the herd to safety. The matriarch ensures a higher survival rate of her members. Um, you can once again listen to Lucy Bates talk on that. It will tell you all about that. Um, and like the bees that we study, that's also a matriarchal society where you've got a queen bee and all the worker bees are females as well. So I feel if we look at nature to teach us lessons, we need to improve the role of women in conservation. We need to respect the elders as repositories of knowledge, as the elephants do as well. And we've got a specific program where we bring older grandmothers into the work that we do. We also need to see elephants that connect protected areas as landscape planners for increased biodiversity and not always as damage causing animals. So if we have to look at why should we morally not um, just look at elephants as we would look at a herd of cattle, for instance, 
Um, they've got complex social lives. In South Africa, elephants are classified as sentient beings, which means they have a, an ability to feel what another elephant is feeling. And therefore, you know, you've got to look at them as objects of moral concern. They are empathetic to conspecific. So there's some wonderful anecdotal stories, um, spe specifically in these private reserves where we work, where, um, for instance, three elephants came down to drink water. And the one had a huge hole in its upper trunk and it couldn't drink water. And the landowner was really worried and wanted to phone the warden until he saw that the other elephant sucked up the water, walked to that elephant and put their trunk in its mouth and gave it the water to drink. And so it was actually fine. Um, while the other elephants were empathetic and could help it drink, it would, be, it would recover. And we also know they're very aware of death. They have transgenerational cultures of care. They communicate with intention and complexity. They have very advanced uh, cognitive abilities and they certainly are collective problem solvers. So often a whole herd will work together to try and rescue a little baby or to solve a problem. And then we also know that they're self-aware because of the self-recognition mirror tests that they've passed. So looking at how can we involve women um, in terms of conservation, we're very fortunate to share the landscape with the Black Mamba, all female Black Mamba anti poaching unit. And what we're doing is we're diversifying their skill set um, by teaching them beekeeping and permaculture skills. And this is really important because our collared elephants have flagged corridors um, across Mozambique. And in Mozambique, to diminish human elephant conflict, we would like to use women to um, have beehive fences around their crops and also to grow unpalatable crops as we're doing with the black mambas in order to protect their crops, but also to diversify their income. So as I said before, we know that elephants are scared of bees. We believe that the black mambas and the beekeeping that they do could function as role models and proof of concept for the work we want to do in Mozambique. Um, and also, we know that beehive fences through the great work of Dr. Lucy King in Kenya is a very good way of protecting crops. The bees also pollinate the crops and they increase the productivity. And therefore, it's a very good model to generate alternative income and to foster tolerance where elephants need to cross human dominated landscapes. We've also got a very heartwarming um, program so I've been in conservation for a very long time, but this program always brings me to tears. Um, it's called the Ndlofu Gogo program, where we go and get community grandmothers that often till the land. They've got to look after the children and the great grandchildren and the grandchildren. Um, so there's second and third generation education that takes place through these older women. And we go and introduce them to elephants because they've often been isolated through poverty um, to access protected areas. And we feel this is a very important way of unlocking the knowledge that these older ladies have in terms of medicinal plant use, in terms of tolerance of living with wildlife and to share that with the younger generation. So on that very positive note, I'd like to thank everybody that's um, supported us over all these years. And also if you're interested in um, contacting us, please log on to our Facebook, Instagram, um, or look at our YouTube videos. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michelle. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I would like to invite everybody to um, please ask questions, comment, engage. Uh, you're welcome to use the chat or you're welcome to raise your hand at the bottom of the screen. There are reaction tools and you're welcome to use that to um, attract our attention. Um, Michelle, if I may ask, is there any way we, we can buy your products to support the, um, the honey products, the um, bee related products? Yes, we usually sell them at the local farmer's market. Um, 
but the, the for instance, the Relight B bracelets are available almost throughout South Africa and you can order them online. But, you know, with the bees, we've got to wait for production and they, they do very well in the summer. In the winter, we've got to pull them through a little bit um, to help them. So in summertime, we usually have a flood of stuff and a long list of people that are um, wanting to place orders. But yes, I'd love to get a pot of honey to you because it is simply delicious. Wonderful. Um, then a question from my side. I, I, the different ranges that the that the female and male elephants have that are totally distinguished, and it's perhaps a um, a question that should rather be asked or put to a, to a sandbox um, employee. How does that affect their their planning um, in terms of the you know how do you plan for a park where your males and your females are, are ranging in completely different areas, and does it assist in planning in any way? I think it does assist in how many elephants your protected area can take and how you should spatially plan it. Because I think these bull areas are really important for the bulls to go, to move away from the females and to feed in peace and to put on body weight. Um, and at the same time, you know, the females do need those nutrient rich areas. If they overlap, they might become depleted too quickly. Um, for both males and females. And it, it's very interesting where the elephant densities aren't so high. You find that the bulls and the cows feed on the same species, but different plant parts. But in areas where there's a very high density of elephants, they actually feed on totally different plant species. So the sexual segregation is more, far more intense depending on the density of elephants. Hmm, that's really fascinating i just want to mention that um earlier in the week or well, every thursday morning we are facilitating a series of talks on wildlife security for uh, chuani university of technology and this week the uh presented spoke about heat training heat stands for hostile environment awareness training and it struck me that it's just amazing that these elephants have something you know the rangers can just look at where they walk and where they don't walk and there you have it yes i mean i always love saying that as soon as you fit a collar to an elephant it becomes an intelligent agent so irrespective like of what the politicians <laughs> might be saying the elephant will tell you if this is a safe area or not a safe area you just have to watch their movements um which is incredible so I mean, I think it would be wonderful if one could structure um, anti-poaching patrols in relation to elephant movements where you can see where they're feeling unsafe. And I think you'd you'd probably have more of an effective patrol across a larger landscape if you could um, zoom in on that. That is absolutely fascinating. It, 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 it would be interesting to see if you do exactly that, how your um, wildlife uh, crime reduces. But it's uh, yeah, just speculation. But I think it would be very interesting. Amazing the results that you that you got from this um, from from researching the elephants, researching their movements. Yes, no, it's very very fascinating. And then when you start combining it with all the other studies, like the social landscape, it really it's it's like a big puzzle that you start piecing together. And the amazing thing is, it's across international boundaries. It's not only within one country, you know, 76% of elephants reigns is across more than one political boundary, which brings me back to the fact that most of us believe in the African philosophy of Ubuntu, which is all about connection. And I feel elephants are actually an enactment of the Ubuntu philosophy, firstly, because of their close knit um, units that they have within their families, but also this connecting characteristic that they have by connecting protected areas across very large scales. Mm, amazing. Okay, I see um, Lorraine is commenting in the chat. I just want to, there's a question from Simon, then we're going to see if we somehow can reconnect with Lorraine. Lorraine, if you can hear me, please um, ask your question in, in the chat, then we can just read it out. Um, Simon from Switzerland, hello from Switzerland. Sorry, I cannot speak on mic right now. I have a I have a background in GIS and would like to know how you make the use of GIS into monitoring elephants dynamics. 
only with GPS color data or also satellite imagery. Thank you very much. So um, we've got Dr. Anke, well, she's busy with her PhD. She'll soon be a doctor, but Anke Bedetti um, de Kork, she works day and night using ArcGIS and remote sensing to um, flag, for instance, and there's amazing things you can do. You know, um, once you know that elephants are using a corridor, for instance, through remote sensing, you can see where all the crops are that are within one kilometer from a major footpath. And from work that's been done by Dr. Anna Songhurst in um, the swamps in the Okavongo, we know that if you are within one kilometer of a major elephant footpath, you are going to experience human elephant conflict. So that allows you to actually do land use spatial plan planning in relation to remote sensing and elephant movements, which I think is incredible. Mm -hmm. So yes, to answer Simon's question, we certainly, I mean, it's a very costly exercise to collar elephants. So you have to maximize the analysis that you get out of that. So we definitely do use both those tools. May I ask, just in case I, I might have missed it, how do you select an elephant for coloring? How, how, what is the process? So we, because we're trying to see the different age groups and, you know, they've got different life stages. So we select cows because we want to see how bulls move relative to cows. But then within the bulls, we select those bulls that are breaking away from the family for the first time that have those massive home ranges because they have to set up their must range versus their non-must range. And then we select the bulls that are starting to um, sort of come into their own. So from about 20 to 25, they haven't experienced their first must cycles. And then from 25 to 35, they're having erratic mass cycles. And that's when they start also exploring to see where they should have their must versus their non must range. And then we've got the prime breeders. So those are the bulls that have the regular annual mass cycles until they die. Um, and they've got very discreet and very defined um, must ranges and non must ranges, which are usually centered around these bull areas that I showed you previously that are often focused on where there's just a lot of food, even if it's bad quality. So we're trying to cover that whole range or spectrum of age groups because they move very differently. Mm. All right. So Lorraine's question is um, in the chat. Um, if you know anyone working in Arusha, Tanzania area, I'd be very appreciative. Um, I would suggest that she contacts uh, Chrissy Clark from the PAMS Foundation. She's doing wonderful work with human elephant mitigation, human elephant conflict mitigation. Okay, we can also, yeah, we, we will try and if you don't mind, we can, we can link her with you and perhaps you can send her contact details. Okay, no problem. Lorraine, if, if, um, if you, we have your email address, so we will just pass it on to um, Michelle and then you can exchange um, Chrissy's details. Great. Um, okay, so a question from Dr. Akbula. How can this, your findings be adopted to the study of forest elephants? Thank you. And Dr. Akbula is from Nigeria, hence that question. Um, yeah, it's quite difficult because they're very different in terms of movements, forest elephants and savannah elephants also in terms of social structure sometimes. But I think, I mean, it's it's also different because I think it's fairly dark in the forest. It's, it's quite a difficult landscape to find elephants in unless you're knowing what you're doing. But it would be fascinating to also compare how safety benefits in forest elephants are different from savannah elephants. And I know there were some tracking studies done by Steve Blake a number of years ago where he actually could prove that the road network was one of the biggest factors influencing forest elephant movements because as yeah. roads were being formed, they felt more and more insecure. So they were being cut into smaller and smaller blocks to try and escape the road network. Um, so I do think it's very different. Um, and I'm not sure... In, in which forest areas, if there's subsistence farming, you're also going to find the same pattern that we are finding with the savannah elephants in terms of how they plan crop raiding strategies. So they actually make sure they move to a thick 
um, in where they're invisible, like a thick, dense area of vegetation, and then they use that as a launching pad. So if they move that to that area at dusk, then you can almost be sure they're going to crop raid um, at night. So you can, in a way, you can identify potential crop raiding strategies, and I think that will be fairly universal throughout savanna and um, forest elephants. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, is uh, are bees also being used in in southern Africa to deter elephants from um, crops, or are they mainly used to protect to, to protect trees? Bees. Are you sorry? Yeah. Did you ask yeah. if bees are being used? Um, yes. So bees. Dr. Lucy King has done an amazing work. I think it's more than twenty countries now that are using beehive fences to protect crops. Um, and of course, we're very lucky in Africa, we've got a very aggressive bee species. In Asia, um, the bee species, they're also using bees, but for instance, Antoinette, she had to design a special way in which if the elephant comes near the beehive fence, the shaking of the beehive is not enough to upset those bees, but the lid actually comes off and then the bees come out and frighten the elephant away. But yes, bees are certainly used to protect crops. But we sort of turned that on its head in a novel way to use it to protect um, individual trees that are iconic, like the Marula tree in South Africa. Wow. Thank you for that. I see Simon said, thanks for the answer. Amazing if satellite imagery, imagery helps, to cons uh, helps with conservation. Indeed. Um, Another comment from the chat from Gina. Hello, and thank you, Dr. Michelle, for the talk. I just wanted to ask if um, mice really scare elephants like we see in cartoons. And if it is scientifically proven, can we use them to chase away elephants? And what do you think the impact will be? Unfortunately, I cannot uh, stay to hear my answer, but I will listen to it on YouTube once uploaded. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, there, is a, there is a little bit of evidence that elephants are scared of mice but I think it's not it could be because of their quick movement and that they're difficult to follow that they just get startled but I do also know that at one stage they thought mice um, were carrying some viruses that could help with floppy trunk disease and that could also be a way why elephants a reason why elephants are instinctively scared of mice but I mean, I don't think much research has gone into this, but I can I, I can imagine that the quick erratic movement of a mouse or a rat would startle an elephant. Hmm. Wow. Um, thank you, Gina. Thanks for the question. And yes, this will be on YouTube very soon. Um, so anybody who want to share it, you're most welcome. It's available um, for everybody to learn from that. <laughs> I just want to, to mention that all the uh, and it's fascinating we've had uh, amazing talks this year all on elephants and they were all done by women it, it seems like women are naturally attracted to be researchers in elephants i i, I only know one male researcher um, yes. and everybody else is all women i've i've wondered about that if if this is coincidental if the there is some sort of a trend happening no, I think there is a trend. It's also with the with the great apes, for instance. I think it's. I was True. actually speaking to Herbert Prince, Professor Herbert Prince, about it, and he was saying the difference between women students and male students is women adopt a study like their child, so they stick with it. Where he said, on average, and he said, I'm just being clinical about this. Most males get bored after four years. Um, and want to want to have a new adventure and move to a new species. So I think it's just it's just a character trait that that we sort of adopt the study like our own child and grow it, try and grow it. That's very true. I I can unfortunately unfortunately or unfortunately <laughs> identify with that. <laughs> very interesting. Uh, Michelle, if there are no further questions, we've kept you for an hour now. Um, I see everybody saying thank you very much for the questions. And yeah, it's been an amazing, amazing event. I really learned a lot. Collectively, if you go and watch the videos of this series on YouTube, you will see that there is absolutely no doubt about the intelligence of elephants. Mm. Um, there's really, I mean, Jeannie Cowell also mentioned this one elephant that picked up um, 
a pair of trousers from somewhere and it carried it around and it played with it and it just tossed it around and put it on its back and then <sighs> took it off again. And it just, you know, you, you're fascinated by behavior like that. Um, so it's like you said, we're really dealing with sentient beings who um, display very, very interesting behavior. Yes, and I mean, I think if we can realize that it's a privilege to live with elephants, really it is. In, in terms of the competition that there is in the world, then we'll work harder to try and find novel ways to tolerate each other and um, to really just be fascinated by each other. Because I mean, um, humans are super intelligent, but elephants, what I've learned after 25 years is they are really smart. So it's a blessing to live with them and to learn from them. Definitely. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for attending. We really appreciate it.